Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Jake's Take with Jacob Eichert podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Eichert, the chief content producer and writer of jakestick.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. If you're watching our video please, on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and please subscribe and watch more videos after this conversation is done. If you're listening to this audio on our audio platforms, please give us a five star interview, download this episode, and more episodes as well. It is episode 250. Where has the time gone? So thank you everyone who's been on this journey with me and thank you to all of my guests and also their publicists as well. Without you, we couldn't get to 250. So I'm very grateful for that. Also for this guest, I just, I'm very honored to welcome a Tony award-winning and drama <laughs> desk award-winning producer. He has helped out and produced Mr. Saturday Night, Kimberly Akimbo, The Sign, Sydney Bruce Street Window, and the 2023 Revival of Parade. So please help me welcome Mr. Evan McGill for the podcast. Thank you, Jacob. I appreciate it. Glad, glad, glad to be here and honored to be at your 250th episode. Wow. That, that timed out nicely. Yeah, good episode to be on, right? Congratulations absolutely, to you. Absolutely, Evan. So thank you so much. For getting for coming on to the podcast on this milestone episode, I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Alrighty. So, when did you get interested in theater? Oh, great question. I think my theater, uh, my theater life expands uh, years and years ago. In the eighties, probably, uh, I was six years old. Um, combination of things were happening. Uh, my mom enrolled me in some theater classes locally. I grew up outside of Boston. She had put me in some theater classes to, uh, you know, it was funny as a kid, I wasn't interested in what, ad- what kids were doing. I was more fan- fascinated by what adults were doing. Um, so I wasn't interested in kid things like, you know, playing outside, Matchbox cars, video games, you know. So my mom had to find some sort of outlet for me. So she put me into theater classes at a local community theater. Uh, subsequently to that, my grandmother, uh, who lived in the northeast part of Massachusetts, would used to take me to different performances at her local high schools growing up. So I saw, you know, Oliver Twist and Fiddler on the Roof kind of at a young age. Uh, So I think the combination of things really got me into theater. Um, So by six years old, I was acting. My first role was in the ensemble of Tom Sawyer, a local production put on by this community theater. And over the years, I ended up being in a handful of different productions. Um, We did, I was in a musical of Alice in Wonderland. I was in the Who's Tommy. I was in uh, a touring production of Hansel and Gretel. Uh, so, yeah, so I did theater sort of up throughout my life and, uh, you know, didn't really do anything in high school or college. And I'd say probably in my late 20s, early 30s, my interest sort of re-peaked. And um, that's where we are today. Awesome. You're talking to a fellow theater kid as well. I was <laughs> theater. I was involved with theater activities from fourth grade all the way to senior year of high school. So I always enjoy the theater and everything else. So definitely. And by the way, I was a papa in Fiddler on the Roof of my Oxford oh, Middle production. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So they're way back where. And also in high school, I was the I was in Oliver as well as a book. Oh, film. there you go. Yeah, Oliver is definitely one of my early influences in theater. I can still remember the songs. I still love the movie, the cast album. Uh, so yeah, that was probably the that's my first memory of theater is Oliver. Awesome. So when did that passion evolve and desire to start Evan McGill Productions? Yeah, good question. So, you know, I'd say probably in my late 20s, early 30s, I started seeing, you know, I started, re, you know, I re, re-peaked my interest in theater. I was going to a lot of local productions in Kansas City. I was going to national tours in Kansas City. And um, I can't remember exactly what shows they were, but kind of in the early 2010s, there were a handful of shows playing in New York that sort of piqued my interest. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go to New York and see a couple of shows. I, I'd been traveling for business. So, you know, to travel from one spot to the next was pretty easy. So I started going to New York and that became sort of one weekend a year. And by 2019, I was sort of up to like three weeks a year. Um, I would say probably in like, you know, 2016, 2017, um, I really was really passionate about the industry. Um, I knew I wasn't talented enough to make it as an actor, nor did I quite frankly feel like trying. I'm not a great singer and you know I haven't acted since I was pre-high school, so didn't have that skill set. And at that point I was a partner in a business, a medical device business in Kansas City. So I sort of 
you know, enjoyed business and wanted to be on the business side of whatever I was doing. And I think that's so what it piqued my interest. I said, hey, I wonder what this theater business looks like. So I'd say in like 2017, I started reaching out to a handful of producers who were working on different shows that I had read about and just to kind of start building building my network. Um, I didn't end up working on those shows, uh, but, you know, I started to, you know, kind of meet some people. Um, uh, the pandemic hit, we sold my company. And I'd say by the end of like 2021, I was like, okay, you know, the business is sold. I've done a little bit of traveling and coming out of this pandemic, Broadway is going to reopen. It's like, seems like a good time to get involved with it. So I reached out to a couple of people I'd met before and a couple of new people. And uh, before I knew it, I was getting involved with some, some pretty, pretty great shows. Awesome. And just to let you know, everyone, I I missed um, when Broadway re was reopened. Sadly, I was heading back from Can I was headed back from Can from New York to Kansas City, where I'm currently am right now. But what was it like being back when uh, Broadway officially said we're reopening? Yeah, I think it depends who you were. <laughs> uh, for me, it was exciting because you know, 18 months of no theater, technically 19 months, um, you know, was sort of painful. Um, I think theater people were really excited. I think certain people were sort of nervous. I mean, there was still there was still a mask made on mask mandate on Broadway for you know basically almost a year. It seems like um, you know uh, yeah about a year. So I mean, theater was open. Everyone was wearing masks, and uh, you know, I think it was exciting for a lot of people to bring these shows back. Um, you know, some uh, there was some good stuff that had been lined up right ahead of the closing that reopened. Um, there was a few shows that did not come back, but you know, I think I think for the industry, that first year back was kind of a struggle. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it, it just it, we had to reopen. So it had to happen. But there was some exciting things that happened. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think we're all sort of glad that we're sort of past that that time frame. But it was exciting for me. I'm so excited to hear that. And believe me, last I went back to New York last year and saw MJ the musical. Yeah. Oh, my God. That show was, I got to say, run. Don't walk. It's fabulous. And it, I'm Fantastic. touring right now. So yep. I'm, by the way, I'm not being paid by the MJ the musical. I'm just a huge super fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, M MJ's a great show. Great, great, interesting story. Great choreography. Um, the man who originated the role of MJ, Miles Frost, he's left the show in April, but he's joining the London production in March as they open in, in West End London. So that'll be exciting. But yeah, also on tour for anyone who's not in New York or London, the show is touring the country uh, right now. And I got to say, I thought I'm so grateful I saw it. Miles <clears throat> Brock play MJ, that yeah. he definitely deserved that tone. Yep, he was great. Fantastic. All right. So we're not here to talk about MJ. <laughs> we're here to talk about you. <laughs> so you first, when you first entered the world of Broadway, you worked on several cast albums. So with both the revival of The Music Man and yep. with Bunny Girl. So two way talked about. Broadway revivals with their cast yeah. recording. So what were some of the lessons that you learned during these recording processes? Good question. Um, you know, whenever you're recording a cast album, just like you're doing a show, you know, you're involved with a lot of different unions, actors union, musicians union. I think I learned that business more of how that all works, the inner workings of that. Um, Cause you don't always get, you don't always get to work on all that stuff as a co-producer. That's a lot of stuff the leads handle of this, these shows, but you know, having being being involved with the albums and you know a small group, got to learn more about that. Um, I got to learn more about you know so the music industry, not just the theater industry. Um, what's great about cast albums is is that they're available forever. You know, when a when a show plays on Broadway and it plays for a year and it closes, a lot of times the revenue sort of tied to that show, unless it goes on tour, does sort of disappear. So um, when you have an album, I mean that album could be out forever. So I mean, I talked about listening to the Oliver album from you know, decades and decades ago. So every time I listen to that, you know, it generates revenue for the writers and the people involved. So, I mean, the, the legacy of the show really sits with the album. And I think that's what's, what's important. And like you said, those were two very top billed albums uh, and shows, which was exciting. I mean, you had the Music Man with Hugh Jackman and Sutton Foster. You had the Funny Girl recording with Leah Michelle. So, I mean, these were two very successful, very well talked about shows. And uh, so it was sort of an honor to be involved with those kind of getting things off the bat. I was definitely very fortunate. And uh, you, I got to say, those were two very talked about out revivals and to have the opportunity mm -hmm. to work with Pete, those heavy hitters like Hugh Jackman, Senna Foster, Liam Shell, and I believe yep. Tola Feldish and Raman yep. and Raman were also, I'm sorry if I butchered his last name, you know who I'm talking about. Yep. 
Yeah, the uh, the Funny Girl album was interesting because, you know, as many people, especially those who follow the theater world are, are aware of, you know, Leah Michelle was not the original Fanny Bryce in the revival of Funny Girl. Um, Beanie Feldstein, the actress, Jonah Hill's sister, uh, was casted to be the Fanny Bryce. And when the show opened in early 2022, Beanie was the character. So um, the show got very mixed reviews. And uh, Beanie had actually was actually leaving the show by the end of July. It was ended up not being a good fit uh, for both sides, it seems like. Uh, so really what happened was is that Leah was then brought in to play Fanny beginning Labor Day weekend 2022. And a cast album was never recorded with Beanie Feldstein. So I remember when the album came out, people were ecstatic. But there was still a handful of Beanie Feldstein fans who were kind of upset and disappointed. Didn't think, you know, Beanie, thought Beanie got the short end of the stick. And um you know, but Leah ended up having a very historic run with Funny Girl, and uh, it's great that the album now preserves that her that year that she spent in the show. It was exactly a year. Absolutely, and I'm so glad that Leah finally was able to play Fanny because she's been planning on that since she was in Glee. Yeah, it's a funny it's a funny story. Like if you followed her career, you sort of saw this character she played on Glee who wanted to be in Funny Girl and loved it, and then you know the the real life person you know ends up playing Funny Girl. It was a good story. And uh, it, the show did very well uh, financially, and um, it's, it ended its run on Labor Day, but it is now on tour, not with Leah or with any of the other cast members, but it is on tour now um, throughout the country. Absolutely. I definitely want to see that if it stops in Kansas City. So yeah. let's talk about your selection process. And when do you decide, what, and can you describe how, like, what Broadway productions you want to join to my audience? Yeah. I think my, the way I've, you know, we all, we all go through sort of an educational process whenever we enter a new job, new industry. So, you know, I think for me, I look at every single show that's going to play on Broadway. Um, that's going to be, you know, what is going to be produced by a for-profit entity. Um, about 70% of Broadway shows are, you know, for-profit entities, but 30% are produced by nonprofits such as Lincoln Center Theater, Manhattan Theater Club, Roundabout Theater. So I'm always looking at these shows that are coming in, um, and I could be looking anywhere from a year and a half to, you know, a few weeks out before it hits Broadway. Um, earlier, the better, of course. But I think my selection process is a combination of things. I, I look for shows that, first of all, I look for shows that interest me. Um, I look for shows that I think have interesting topics, interesting scores. If it's a musical, I look at who's going to be in the show. Are there going to be big stars in it? So I sort of, you know, all those things sort of come into play. And then, you know, Broadway is a business. So I'm looking at kind of the financial side of it. I mean, which shows do I think? could be financially viable, which shows I think are going to generate a big audience for a long period of time. Um, you know, an original musical basically has to play for a year uh, to be financially viable. So, I mean, that's, and it's, they all sort of vary, but that's kind of the benchmark that I use is if the show can really make its capitalization back in a year, that's a good thing. But, you know, only 13% of Broadway shows, are, you know, play for a year. So there's not that many. So you're looking for all these different selections. Um, if I'm looking at plays, I'm looking at, you know, who's starring in it. A lot of shows need, a lot of shows that are plays need stars to star in them to generate an audience. Um, believe it or not, about two thirds of Broadway shows are plays, but, you know, Broadway is thought to be, you know, as, as you know, people think of Broadway as musicals, but there's still a lot of different plays that come through Broadway and most of them play, you know, only 16 or 17 weeks. So you're saying to yourself, you know, which big star can we get in this role that's going to sell tickets out for, you know, for that short window and make the show successful. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, uh, and I, I don't think there's just one thing, but, you know, it's a, it's a combination of things that make a show interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you've been involved with some really cool productions. So yeah. let's start with Mr. Saturday Night. I believe it was Billy Crystal that brought the yeah. show back to life. Yeah, it was. So it was based on Billy's uh, movie from the early 90s, Mr. Saturday Night. Um, it was a musical version of that. Uh, Billy wrote the book uh, with his two writing partners from the movie. And then the Jason Robert Brown and Amanda Green did the score for it. Uh, and that was sort of that, you know, that was that first season of the pandemic. And I think we were all sort of trying to guess how, how things were going to go. You know, Billy has been such a big name you know, in the, in theater and in movies and in the entertainment world for so long, you know, we were curious how that was going to going to go. Um, personally, I love the show. I thought it was hilarious. It was great humor. It was Billy's comedy. Um, unfortunately, the show did not do well financially. It only played for about six months on Broadway, but um, you know, the people that attended it loved it. And uh, you know, that was, that was sort of a, an important thing in that first year, getting just people back to the theater and Billy was fantastic. He did 
every show he didn't have an un- Billy didn't even have an understudy. He was Billy Crystal in Mr. Saturday Night. So every show he was he did seven shows a week every week for six months. But uh, you know he did a he did a fantastic job. It was great to have him back on Broadway. Absolutely, because I that show was the one that got away from me because I wish I was there when it launched because Billy Crystal is a I'm a huge Billy Crystal fan. Yep. He's one of my all time favorite people in the entertainment industry. So I'm so glad he had the honor and privilege to work with him. Yeah, opening night was fun. All of his friends were there: Martin Short, Steve Martin, Tina Fey, uh, Jimmy Fallon. There was a lot of people at opening night to to root for Billy. So it was a it was a fun show to be involved with. And not to mention, he's getting his well deserved Penny Center honor later this year as well. Yes. Yep. He's uh, he's got he's had an amazing career. Awesome. So let's talk about one show that hadn't talked about. It's like literally social media word of mouth. It's Kimberly uh, Kimbo. So can you yeah. describe the show and how you got involved with it? Yeah, sure. So Kimberly Akimbo was actually based on a play by the same writer. So there was a play 20 years ago called Kimberly Akimbo that David Lindsay Abair had written. And uh, he was a pro- he was approached by a Jean- Janine Tesori, who's another uh, who's a composer. And they said, you know, this would be a great thing to kind of make a musical. And I'm talking this is like five or six years ago when they had this conversation. So um, so Kimberly Akimbo uh, was an off Broadway transfer. It started at the Atlantic Theater. Uh, in a very small theater, sort of off Broadway, and got great, great off Broadway reviews. And you know, we decided to move it to Broadway to a bigger stage. Um, Kimberly Akimbo, sort of a unique story, kind of quirky. It's about a girl who's 16 years old, uh, but she has a disease, and she looks like she's 70 years old. And it talks about sort of her life in New Jersey with weird parents and a crazy aunt, and kind of dealing with school and the social scene. So it kind of covers a lot of different stuff. And without giving away the full story. Um, it's kind of a very quirky musical, a uh, very fun musical, great score, fun story. It won five Tony Awards, including Best Musical, Best Book, Best Score. And then Victoria Clark, who plays Kimberly, won Best Lead Actress. And Bonnie Milligan, who, well, who plays her aunt, uh, Aunt Deborah, won Best Supporting Actress. So um, it was the most award, it won the most Tony Awards this past year, uh, five total. And that's amazing. Five Tony Awards. It's incredible. Yeah. And not to mention, there's not a lot of people that do off Broadway for shows that go up. Like, I can think of the top of my head that really go well. We, there's a little show called Hamilton, and then yeah. off in Avenue Q. Yeah. Yeah. Avenue Q was a big off Broadway transfer. Hamilton was obviously a huge one. But yeah, I mean, you know, some shows. You know, every show is sort of a different path. Kimberly sort of followed the off Broadway to Broadway path. Um, most shows follow the out of town to Broadway path, meaning they play somewhere like Chicago or La Jolla Playhouse in La Jolla outside of San Diego is a big breeding ground for Broadway. Um, there's also shows that play at the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle, the Buell in Denver. I mean, there isn't any rule per se of where you have to start to get to Broadway, but a lot of shows will start out of town and sort of, you know, build some buzz out of town, work out the kinks with a big audience. But yeah, Kimberly was one of the, like the shows you mentioned that sort of started off Broadway and then had a Broadway transfer. Um, so yeah, the uh, the Broadway, the off Broadway to Broadway transfer time frame was about ten months, um, which you know is, is pretty good. So some shows will be you know play off Broadway in a fall and then play on Broadway the next spring, but some will take years. You know, Here Lies Love, which is on Broadway right now, I think played off Broadway in maybe twenty fourteen or twenty sixteen. So you know, a long time for its you know off Broadway to Broadway transfer. But yeah, there's there's no right way to get to Broadway. It's uh, off Broadway, out of town, um, and sometimes not, none of the above. So it's all they're all different. Awesome. Um, one musical I want to talk to you about because that's very important to me is yep. per, is the twenty twenty three revival of Parade. Yeah. And it's a very heavy musical. A lot, yep. especially with the rise of anti semitism going on in yep. this country and. How were, did you get involved with them? Because it's Michaela Ben Platt and Michaela Diamond. Yeah, it's a big, big, big cast, big stars. Um, so Parade played at New York City Center for one week in November, and they had actually been developing Parade to play it somewhere for years, you know, sort of pre-pandemic as well, with Ben and Michaela, sort of in workshops and different readings. Um, to give you a little background, Parade was a revival, so it played on Broadway originally in 1998, played at the Lincoln Center Theater. And it was not successful um, on Broadway from a financial sense. Um, it was nominated for Best Musical, but did not win. It won Best Score and it won Best Book, um, but it did not win Best Musical. I think it only ended up playing on Broadway for about three months. It did not do well um, for its first Broadway run. 
Um, but as you mentioned, the show deals with some pretty heavy topics, the biggest one being anti-Semitism. And I think probably in 1998, we weren't as aware of you know, anti-Semitism in modern times as we are now. Um, so to bring back that show in 2023, I think the, the story resonated a lot more with the things going on in our world. So, um, but the show played for one week at New York City Center and had a great run, got great reviews. And then, you know, the, the, it was decided that it was going to be a, tra- a Broadway transfer. Um, you know, so technically City Center is off Broadway, but, you know, it, it wasn't a traditional, you know, off Broadway run to Broadway. So because it only played one week at City Center. So a uh, group, group came together, got the money raised for it and, you know, had been the a lot of the cast came from City Center to Broadway, but not the full cast. But Ben and Michaela were still there. Uh, we began previews in February when we ran the show. Um, opening night was March 16th, I believe. And it was always supposed to be just a limited 24-week run. And that's what it ended up being. So we ran it till October 6th. I think we closed it. Um, so, yeah, it was a very successful run. It got six Tony nominations. It won Best Director of a Musical for Michael Arden, and it also won the award for Best Revival of a Musical, 2023 Best Revival. So, and uh, that's how I got my Tony Award, so, as one of the co-producers. I just want to say congratulations on you, yeah. win, winning your Tony. I just yep, saw here, and, and, and and here it is, right here. And there there's that Tony. <laughs> First time in podcast history that we have a, a Tony winning <laughs> producer. So thank you so much for showing that Tony off because I think you'll inspire a lot of, of our theater listeners. Yep. So what does it mean to earn, to be part of a production that has won both a drama desk and also that Tony? Yeah, it means a lot. You know, it, it means... um. It means the production resonated with a lot of people. It means a lot of people recognize the incredible work it was. Um, and then, you know, and for me, you know, being a Jewish man and being a Ben Platt fan and loving the music, I mean, it means everything to be involved with a show like that. It's the kind of show that if I had seen and I had not been involved, I would have been like, God, how did I miss that? You know, because that's it's just a really beautiful show. And um, it was got great reviews from both, uh, you know, the, the media writers and from, you know, the People on show score, who, you know, who individuals like you and I who review shows. Um, so it really was, uh, it, it was so impactful. It, the show just meant so much. And um, it's, you know, I wish I could find a show like Parade every year that has this, you know, just such impact that people just really flock to, really enjoy, great cast, award winning, you know, et cetera. That's incredible. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Right now, Broadway's in the middle of 2023 2024 season. Yep. So what have been some of your early takes? Are Is there any shows that's going to be a front runner? Or yeah. are there shows that are waiting, that you're still waiting on to premiere? Um, you know, good question. This, there's going to be a lot of new musicals this year. And it's, you know, for the last couple of years, there's sort of been like eight or nine new musicals a year. I think this year there could be as many as 15. So I think there'll be somewhere between 12 and 15 new musicals this year, which really does make things, makes things exciting. So the way the Tony nominees work is that if there's eight new musicals in a season, then they can, up to four can be nominated for best musical. They don't have to nominate four, but they can go up to four. Once they hit nine, they can nominate up to five. So in any given year, it's not necessarily super hard to guess what the best five shows out of nine is. But when you're talking 15 new shows, it can be a little harder to gauge, you know, maybe in those, you know, third, fourth, fifth slots, kind of what shows are going to be in there. So it'll be, it's going to be a competitive season, but yeah, there's going to be as many as 15 new musicals this year. So that's exciting. So, you know, I've looked at a lot of them. Um, I, I will be involved with a few, but I can't share that yet. But uh, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of exciting and different shows this year. There's uh, the shows based on films, the shows based on existing musical catalogs. Um, some shows have already opened like Back to the Future or Once Upon a One More Time, or Here Lies Love. And then, you know, coming this fall, coming this spring, you're going to have a, a lot of new shows like The Notebook. You're going to have the musical version of The Notebook. You're going to have the musical of The Outsiders. Um, it's a real diverse mix of shows this year. There's established names you know, and there's brand new shows. So we'll see uh, We'll see what ends up rising to the top. It'll be exciting. And, you know, on the revival side, there's some really great revivals coming out. You're going to have the revival of Cabaret uh, coming from London. You're going to have the revival of Spamalot, which was, you know, which has always been a a fan favorite. So um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of good, a lot of good shows coming out this year. Speaking of spam a lot, I did yeah. see spam a lot with Julia Shade and the late Marin Mazzi. And oh, oh my God, that show yeah. is amazing. And yeah. I'm so, I see the cast for this revival. I'm 
I'm I'm really debating on going to me coming to New York and seeing that revival. Yeah, this is really it's a great Broadway cast, and then you also have Merrily We Roll Along, which just is, is opening on Tuesday. It's in previews right now. It's got Daniel Radcliffe, Jonathan Groff, Lindsay Mendez. It's getting great reviews. It played off Broadway for a couple of weeks last year, and now it's transferring. Uh, and then you're gonna have The Wiz as well, uh, which is on tour, but also it's touring and coming to Broadway. So. I actually saw it uh, last week in Baltimore, so it's coming to Broadway this spring. So, um, yeah, so far I think there's been, uh, let me think, 18, 19, there's been about 20, 25 shows announced for this coming season. Usually in a season there's anywhere between 35 and 40. So there's still, uh, there's still, there's still more to come, still more news and shows coming this spring especially. It's going to be a busy spring on Broadway. That's amazing. So second to last question, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, if you have the opportunity to meet with people who said, hey, I would love to get involved with Broadway, no matter if they're a publicist or yeah. they're part of the production team or they're yep. working as with the crew or musicians, what yep. advice would you share with them? Yeah, I would say you have to network. You have to get to know people in the industry. Um, ask as many questions as you can to anyone who will listen to you. Um, the good news is, is that the younger you are, the easier it is to do this. So when you're in high school and college, it's easy to call a producer or a casting agent or a publicist and say, hey, you know, I'm in school and I really want to learn about this. You know, could I interview you, do an informational interview with you? You know, could I take you to lunch? I'm going to be in New York, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's easier to do that when you're a little younger. When you get to be my age, it can be a little harder because, you know, people think you're just strange. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, as, as if, you're def if you're younger, it's definitely easy to do it. But whatever age you are. You know, find someone who will, who will listen to you and ask questions, express your interests. You know, for me, it was just getting to know a few people and just having them understand that, you know, I want to be involved with this and get involved and be part of great new productions. And when they needed people for different things, they thought about me. It's like, oh, yeah, I met this guy. He really wants to get involved with some stuff. And, you know, you just get to know more and more people, the more involved you are. Uh, but this is a pretty welcoming industry. You know, if you think of the movies, the TV, music. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, maybe I'm biased, but I think theater is sort of the most welcoming of the, the four industries. Um, so yeah, just uh, find out what you want to do and ask questions. If you want to be an actor or an actress, you know, un go to Broadway, see a couple shows and understand where the bar is. You know, the talent level on Broadway for actors and actresses is insane. And, you know, it's not that you can't get there, but you just have to understand what's, what dedication you're going to have to make uh, to, to be, you know, be in a position where you can be as good or better as these people on stage right now. Cause as I said, the, the people are just unreal. You know, people get upset when there's an understudy in for a lead they wanted to see, but that understudy is still in the top 0.01% of singing actor dancers in the world. So, but. Uh, and I gotta yeah. give a shout out to Juju B who was phenomenal yeah. in yeah. Funny Girl. I wish I had a chance to see her because I received, I've heard so many incredible, wonderful things when she stepped in for Leah. Yep, Julie Beko's great, and she will be in Harmony this uh, this fall, uh, opening in a couple of weeks on Broadway. So if you still want to see her, you can see her in Harmony. Absolutely. So last question, are you ready? Yeah. Where can my audience connect with you, and when they, and where can they learn more about Evan McGill Productions? Sure. I have a Facebook page, so just search Evan McGill Productions. I try to post as much as I can about the things I'm working on. I'm also on LinkedIn, Evan McGill. You can reach me there. So, yeah, but if anyone has any questions, I, I love talking about theater, not just my own shows. I love talking about Broadway and the industry and who's in it and what's coming up and what's played before. So if anyone has any questions, they can always reach out to me, um, Facebook or LinkedIn for sure. Absolutely. Guys, if you missed an episode of the Chicks Take the Jacob Show podcast, visit our channels on Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Podcasts, Find her radio, podcast addict, Spotify, and Spreaker. Once again, it's Jake's Take with Jacob L. H. R. J. A. C. O. B. E. L. Y. A. C. H. A. R. Now, are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too. Please search me on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, TikTok, X, and YouTube. Jacob L. H. R. J. A. C. O. B. E. L. Y. A. C. H. A. R. Now, if you want to know more about mass singers, want to listen to more of my conversations, want to hear about my take on new music, Visit jakes.shake.com. Once again, jakes.shake.com. Evan, thank you so much for getting time in your schedule to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. Congratulations for all your success. And I cannot wait to hear about these new productions that are going to be coming up 2023, 2024. Yeah, can't wait. Thank you so much. And thanks to the audience for listening. 
You're so welcome. And guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, have a great one, everybody. Goodbye.